thank you everybody for joining today. Just gonna give a couple more minutes for the rest of the attendees to come on in. Make yourselves comfortable. Kenneth, I'll wait for your guidance when uh, everybody in the waiting room has, has entered. I'd say let's give it another minute, two minutes. Okay, okay perfect. Right. Uh, well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to, to everybody. I hope everybody is, is doing well and staying healthy during this uh, still quite difficult time for the, for the global planet and for the industry. Um, and congratulations. I note that one of our viewers today, um, I will save her blushes, is sitting at home with a very, very, very newborn. Um, so congratulations to, to her. Um, in fact, I should mention it because Justina has had quite a big role in, in what we're going to be talking about today. So congratulations, Justina. Um, thank you again for everybody taking the time to join us for this sustainability webinar. It is one of the, the key aspects of today's society. The word sustainability um, almost appears in, in every conversation on every news channel with regards to every topic. Um, now, with regards to today, what, and uh, next slide, please. We actually have three particular um, sessions that we're gonna be looking at. For those of you that um, aren't aware, Tiaco initiated its sustainability program about 18 months ago. And one of the key parts of that was a very widespread survey. And that survey was conducted last year, the end of last year, and the results have now been analyzed and it has been translated into a very comprehensive uh, report. And uh, we have, uh, uh, Celine is gonna run through that report in great detail. What we would then like to do is spotlight each of the three particular areas of focus that we have identified with regards to the Tiaka sustainability agenda, which is people, planet, prosperity. And we have three um, very expert speakers in each of those areas to talk to you today then of course, the really important aspect is, is what happens next. And uh, for those of you that are familiar with Tiaka, you know that we actually like to have, or in fact, it's, it's necessary, the board insists that we have a, an action plan, that we don't just talk about the issues, that we carry them forward and have concrete actions and steps. So we're very pleased to have the chairman of Tiaka Board of Directors, who's gonna talk us through some of the conclusions and the next steps about what uh, we can expect to see happen. So the next slide, please. 
So just give me, let me take about 30 seconds to talk a little bit about the TIARCA sustainability program. Uh, as mentioned, we have identified three very key aspects, which is people, planet, prosperity. And what we actually have focused on within those is the need to have a, as it were, a united voice, keep the industry together with a, a common vision and common objectives, work collaboratively to make sure that we can create an inclusive and diverse workforce, which is so critical. And of course, prosperity and prosperity is, is not just about individual organizations. It's about the global society, it's about countries, and it's about each of us as individuals. A prosperous society is one that can then actually help contribute to improve the overall society. Now, we also recognize that none of these initiatives or objectives can be achieved alone, which is why partnerships is one of the critical enablers to achieve anything that we want to achieve as a community. And another aspect that I think we have to all recognize is the fact that the thinking that's got us up till now is, the not, is not the thinking that's gonna get us to the next stage. So we require new thought processes, new way of tackling issues, and therefore innovation is absolutely critical, which is our second key enabler. Uh, and this is really where we get our three plus two um, program motto from. So it's people, planet, prosperity, enabled by innovation and partnerships. So today, as I say, we've got a lot of material to go through. We would invite and we would welcome questions. We wanna make sure that this is an interactive webinar. Um, so if there's something that you wanted to, even if it was a comment, please use the chat box or a question, use the chat or the Q&A boxes as well. We'll be monitoring those throughout the webinar um, and therefore we can actually put them to the, the relevant speaker as they may arise. Um, if they require a little bit more research, then we might take them offline and come back to the, uh, to the group afterwards. But of course, we should say that this webinar, like all other webinars and meetings, is held in full compliance with TIARCA's antitrust guidelines. So we will be monitoring the questions. And obviously, please um, don't feel um, slighted if, if there is a question that goes beyond that, which we can actually comfortably ask one of the, uh, one of the speakers. Um, and therefore, we would obviously not be able to ask it in a public forum. But uh, I'm sure we've got a very engaged and uh, highly familiar with all the compliance regulations audience, so I don't anticipate any issues with that. So next slide, please. Now it gives me great pleasure to actually introduce Celine Hercard. Um, Celine is the CEO and founder of Change Horizon. Um, it's a, an organization which has a, a number of key focus areas, such as organizational and industry transformation. Sustainability is obviously one of the critical areas that uh, the organization looks after, and as well as developing the next generation workforce. Um, previously, Celine headed up the IR to cargo transformation activity and was our partner for this survey and the report that uh, she's gonna run through the uh, results of now. So without any further ado, I hand over to Celine. Thank you, Glyn. Uh, good, uh, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, wherever you are on the planet. Uh, so my name is Celine Orcad, and I'm uh, working uh, with Change Horizon, which is a company that I've uh, uh, set up in September 2019. So quite, uh, quite new. Uh, I'm working with Justina uh, Messeye who's on the webinar today, but on maternity leave uh, because she uh, just uh, had her baby. Um, and Justina uh, has uh, done a tremendous work on this report. Uh, so it's really uh, a team uh, teamwork, but that she led. So I'm, I'm pleased to, uh, to present uh, uh, really the the work that uh, that she uh, she did uh, just before leaving for uh, maternity. So today I'd like to uh, talk about uh, uh, accelerating sustainable transformation of air cargo and moving from talks to action. This is really the findings of this uh, first uh, survey that we ran for Tiaka last year. Um, as part of Tiaka's sustainability program, um, that that uh, we uh, we are uh, driving uh, in Change Horizon. Um, we worked with the Sustainability Working Group, 
uh, and for instance, Stefan Noll uh, from CHAMP is part of the working group. Uh, so we worked with the working group to design a survey. Uh, it's the, the objective is really to, uh, to collect information, really good insights on sustainability, uh, the current status, the current actions, the focus, uh, the you know the the real commitments and actions that are being uh, undertaken by the uh, air cargo industry. We called it a first the first uh, survey uh, first because we uh, uh, we are planning to run uh, the survey you know on an annual basis and and start monitoring progress. So this uh, the the coming presentation is really the findings uh, of this uh, first survey. We had for this first one we had 127 uh, answers, and it's from you know the entire uh, air cargo supply chain. Uh, also different uh, uh, company type, different uh, size of the business, and also geographic location that are also diverse. Uh, what we want is not only to set up the, the baseline and to uh, monitor progress annually, but also to enlarge uh, the number of um, uh, respondents uh, for the next uh, surveys. And, and make sure that we really cover the entire supply chain in terms of you know, business model, company type, size, and geographic location. So we'd like to uh, uh, further improve in the, in the coming years. So one of the first questions that we ask in the survey is, uh, it was a free text. Um, it was for the respondents to define or to give their own definition of sustainability. And not surprising, uh, the results showed that there is not one single uh, definition that is being used by, by the, the different uh, organizations. Uh, what we, we saw in the, in the comments, so in the, in the free text, most of the, the, the mentions were around environment. So it's not surprising. It's, it, it was quite a lot of uh, also uh, mention of emissions, of long term, and then some uh, mentions of social, economic, people, etc. But mainly the, the, the response from the survey were uh, on environment. It's not very surprising and it's okay to not have the same um, definition of sustainability because frankly, sustainability depends, you know, the way you, you, you uh, define it and prioritize the actions around sustainability. It really depends on the size of your business, but also on the region you are serving, the customers you are serving, etc. So it, it has a different, uh, different meaning and it's okay. It does reflect the reality of the business. Tiaka's sustainability vision that uh, uh, Glyn just mentioned is doing good for the planet, the people and the business. So it's, it's the, the traditional three Ps, people, prosperity and planet. Uh, so nothing uh, uh, fancy about that. It's really uh, uh, the classic definition with those two enablers, uh, innovation and partnerships. And what, what Tiaka wanted to do with that uh, definition was to really offer a flexible, inclusive uh, approach to sustainability, uh, while uh, the, the objective is to drive sustainability, uh, sustainable transformation for the industry. So we ask also uh, in the survey, why is it that sustainability is important for them? And, and the results show that it's good for the business from what respondents said. Uh, it's 79% uh, believe that it's good for their company's reputation. Uh, and if the company's reputation is, uh, is good or better or improving, this is good for the business. It's 62% uh, uh, saying their organization will be more attractive, more attractive to customers and to employees. And that's also good for the business. 
And then 39% believe that uh, it will also positively impact their bottom line already. Uh, in the comments, because we ask quite a lot of questions with, uh, with uh, free comments, uh, to, to really try to, uh, to understand and get the maximum feedback. Uh, in the comments, there was a lot of uh, mentions of credibility. So it's important for uh, organizations, for companies uh, to be credible on the market, credible in front of their uh, customers and employees. And the reason I'm saying customers and employees, it's because we also ask the question, why does or should sustainability matter to your company? And it's more than 70% uh, of uh, respondents that said that it's important for their customers, it's important for their employees. So that are the two main drivers uh, for sustainability. Just after that, it's important for business partners. And we can see that and when and that's why it's so important to talk about partnership here uh, you know it's it's cascading so the priorities uh, on sustainability the focus uh, it's cascading from customers employees and business partners they all want to have uh, sustainable uh, partners to work with uh, in the in the lower category it's important for local community for shareholders and for regulators so i was a bit surprised and a bit concerned personally on the the this uh, result for regulators in one way it's it's very good because what what we don't want is to have uh, an industry that is moving only because it's uh, pushed by regulation um, but traditionally, the air cargo industry has transformed, uh, um, uh, changed, uh, adopted new things, mainly when it was uh, required uh, by regulators. So I have a bit of concern here. Is it going to happen, the, the sustainable transformation of the industry, if it's not a strong push from regulation? Question mark. Um, so we, we see that customers, employees, business partners are the main drivers in general. Uh, but when we look at the, the responses by region, uh, we see some uh, differences. So for instance, uh, in America, so it combines uh, North and, and Latin America. Uh, but in America, it's, uh, it's more important for local communities than the average. And it's less important for shareholders than the average. Uh, for in Europe, it's interesting to see that, you know, the, the score on the importance for regulators and shareholders is way above the average. Uh, so it's, it's, I don't know if we can say it's a sign that uh, Europe is really actively you know, pushing um, uh, at political level or through the, the citizens. Uh, and that's why it's important for shareholders and regulators. Uh, but that's, uh, that's what uh, this uh, uh, graph is, uh, is showing. In Africa and Middle East, uh, the, the employee factor, the driver from the employees is way above the, uh, the average, the industry average. Uh, while for the co local community and shareholders, it's way below the, uh, the average. And in Asia, uh, well, everything looks uh, uh, less important than the average, especially on the regulatory side. Uh, so we can we can really see that uh, there are difference, dif differences between regions, and it it's uh, uh, driven also by cultural differences, uh, different type of pressure uh, by the citizens and uh, and uh, society uh, in those regions. We ask also uh, a few questions to understand, you know, the how uh, sustainability agenda is progressing uh, year over year. 
And it's a 63% uh, who said that sustainability is uh, was more important in 2020 compared to 2019 for the, in, within their own company. Uh, 42% indicated that uh, the budget allocated to sustainability has increased between uh, 2020 and uh, 2029, uh, uh, 2019. Um, and we asked specifically uh, the question on the impact of COVID. And, and it's, uh, it's not completely surprising, but it's 37% uh, declared that COVID-19 had a positive impact on their corporate sustainability strategy. Uh, so we had in the comments, you know, some comments around uh, the fact that um, uh, COVID has put on hold uh, sustainability at the beginning of the, the pandemic crisis. Um, and it was the case with Intiaka, for instance. Um, but but uh, when the, the economy restarted, uh, when, when people got back on track, uh, they, uh, they started with a, a greater focus on sustainability. So that's... Uh, that's an, an interesting thing. We, we keep on talking about the restart, the next normal, et cetera, and, and, and uh, the opportunity to restart better, greener, uh, more efficient, uh, digital, et cetera. And I think uh, it's what, uh, what we can see uh, already from, from those uh, reasons. We ask um, the question on what are the areas of focus for your company in terms of sustainability? And we, we, uh, we gave them uh, those options to, uh, to choose. Uh, and for each uh, of the, uh, the elements, they were asked to uh, indicate if they are um, in the, they do not focus at all, the, uh, they have like an awareness stage, they are on the uh, reporting, measurement reporting stage, improvement stage. Um, here we are showing uh, the, from, from the most to uh, least focused areas. Um, and we decided to, um, to uh, move away a bit for this one. Uh, from the classic people, planet, and prosperity uh, elements into three different uh, ways, three different ways to uh, to see uh, to see the the focus. The first one is the license to operate. So the the result of the survey showed that uh, the the focus of companies in air cargo is operational excellency, uh, safety, digital transformation reliability and quality of service and security. I'd like to just remind you at that point that the survey has been responded by a variety uh, of um, uh, players. So airports, airline, freight forwarders, trucking companies, packaging companies, also media, associations, etc. It just to explain that you know, we, we used to say safety and security are our number one, uh, number one uh, priority and focused for aviation. Uh, it's, it's already visible within the uh, airlines and the airports, but it's not uh, always the primary focus for absolutely everyone, which is why we don't have safety and security at 100%. It doesn't uh, change uh, the the focus on safety and security for 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 airlines, for instance. Um, what is really interesting here to uh, to see is the digital transformation that uh, made it to uh, to this first category, license to operate. Without uh, a digital plan in place, uh, without digital processes in place it's going to be very difficult for companies not just to survive, but just to, to operate. The second category, uh, we would classify them as the license to grow. So that's uh, what you need to do if you want to uh, continue existing, surviving in the next few, year, few years. 
So it's the focus on, on CO2 and greenhouse gases emissions, uh, focus on people, uh, training and education, waste management and energy consumption. So those four areas are really in this category that, that we, uh, uh, we say license to grow. And the third one, uh, we would call them the differentiators. What makes you uh, different? Uh, so it doesn't mean that it's less uh, important. It means that it's going to, uh, to uh, really uh, make a company uh, more competitive uh, compared to, uh, to the others if they are uh, you know, focusing on, on those elements. Uh, community involvement. Uh, diversity, inclusion, employee experience, and human trafficking in the in the people category, and then water management, air quality, biodiversity, noise, and illegal wildlife trafficking in the planet uh, category. Let me go into the prosperity uh, part, uh, and it's it's actually the five elements that are really uh, the license in within the license to uh, to operate category. Um, I'd like to uh, to focus on the digital transformation here. Um, Glenn just mentioned before that uh, I used to be the head of cargo transformation at IATA. I started my career with uh, digital transformation projects in. Uh, the passenger world and then in cargo world, uh, e-cargo, e-airwebile, e-freight, everything e, uh, was always quite high on the agenda, at least on what we said uh, the, uh, the air cargo industry uh, should focus on. But it took a while uh, for the majority of companies to really take it seriously and to have it embedded in their real uh, um, corporate strategy. And now I'm very pleased to see that it has elevated itself into this uh, category of uh, part of the, the license to operate uh, uh, priorities. Uh, so it's a 61% that uh, of the respondents that are saying that they have a digital transformation plan in place. Um, I would say now we need to make sure that the 39 uh, others, they accelerate the pace uh, because it's, it's really uh, do it or die. In the planet category, um, well, the focus is uh, uh, mainly on, on CO2 and, and greenhouse gases emissions, uh, on waste and energy, and, and uh, the other categories are uh, rated lower in, in, the, in the scheme. It also probably depends on the, uh, the stakeholder type. Uh, the focus for an airport is very different also uh, from, from an airline. Uh, an airport uh, would really look at noise and air quality uh, very carefully uh, because it's also uh, part of their own license to operate uh, within their, their environment. So this is really showing the result at industry level, uh, but obviously there are differences between uh, the, the various stakeholders. Um, so overall, the air cargo industry is really committed to reduce uh, its environmental footprint. And it's something that has started years ago. Um, I know on the, the webinar, I think I saw uh, uh, some people from uh, uh, IATA or ATAG, and this is uh, a, a big focus on, uh, on their side for years. Uh, to, uh, to reduce the environmental footprint of aviation uh, with uh, ambitious targets, with action plans. But now we are also uh, seeing that there are more and more um, you know, initiatives that are helping the entire industry, not just airlines, but also airports, freight forwarders, uh, uh, trucking companies, etc., cetera, to... Um, uh, improve their environmental footprint. It's various type of uh, programs. So it, it's uh, programs towards um, uh, measurements, so harmonization of uh, uh, 
calculation method for emissions, uh, programs to, uh, to uh, offset uh, carbon, uh, programs to, uh, to promote the sustainable alternative fuel, um, uh, programs also uh, to, uh, to promote collaboration between uh, airlines, freight forwarders, and shippers uh, to uh, seek um, uh, better uh, or more sustainable um, uh, transport systems, etc. So there are quite a lot of uh, initiatives uh, out there. And one of the, the comments from uh, the, the respondent in the survey was, please do not come uh, with a new, pro uh, new program that would duplicate the efforts that are being done uh, by the others. And I think it's a call that Tiaka really understood uh, very clearly. And it's uh, from the beginning, not uh, the, um, the objective of Tiaka. It's more to play uh, the, this, this neutral uh, body that would help also matchmaking and help uh, uh, the members and the industry understanding where they can focus their efforts on. Uh, which um, uh, initiatives out there they can they can join, uh, and also uh, look at uniting all the efforts so that we uh, we have a better impact. In terms of uh, people, uh, so the first one, training and education, is really on the second category uh, in terms of priorities. So part of the license to grow. Uh, but it's still worrying to uh, see that it's only six, uh, 53 percent that have uh, training and education programs in place. Uh, very worrying because this is it's not the only one, but this is an industry that is really uh, driven by its people. Uh, the future generation, but all the essential workers. Uh, we are an industry that is moving goods, high um, uh, specialized goods with uh, very specific uh, handling uh, um, uh, requirements or safety requirements, etc. So it's, it, it does rely heavily on training and education to make sure that the workforce is uh, equipped to, uh, to handle uh, cargo uh, properly to deliver the, the uh, excellency and also to, uh, to adapt uh, with the, the new requirements to be agile, uh, to embrace also new technologies, to develop new processes, to be creative and innovative. So training and, edu and education is really key for this industry. So I'm glad to see it as the number one, but I'm I'm personally quite worried to see it's only six, uh, 53 percent that have a program in place. Um, on a very more uh, personal interest uh, and note, something that uh, is really close to my heart for those who know me, um, diversity and inclusion are um, it, it's a topic that is only tackled by 41% of the respondents. Only uh, because, frankly, we are a diverse uh, industry. Uh, we serve the, the global trade. Uh, we serve the global world. And, and it has to be reflected you know, within the, uh, the industry, within the organization, and at all levels in the leadership as well. Uh, so it's, it's uh, in my view, very important to, uh, to progress on diversity and inclusion. Um, so I really hope that uh, uh, in the years to come, we will see uh, this figure uh, improving um, heavily. So in terms of uh, you know, the feedback from the, uh, the industry on that survey, we uh, ask also specific questions on whether or not they were serious about sustainability. Uh, because saying that, uh, yes, we care, yes, we, uh, we have a definition, yes, we think it's good for the business and et cetera, it's not enough. We wanted to also understand how serious they were. Um, 
So it's 91% uh, that uh, said that they have the direct support from their CEO, which is a very good start. 81% um, said that uh, it's a corporate strategy, uh, pri uh, strategic pr priority with concrete actions that they can really see. Another 10% said that yes, it's officially a strategic priority within their organization, but they don't see any concrete action. 78% um, said that, you know, they feel it's embedded in their company's DNA. I think, you know, in the, in the next uh, versions of uh, the survey, we will probably uh, go maybe a, a bit deeper in that question and make sure that, you know, we have uh, the same understanding, so maybe clarify the question here. What what do they mean? Or collect some some feedbacks, comments. Uh, what do they really mean by it's embedded in their company's DNA? Uh, Seventy-five percent uh, they they declare that uh, they have a strategy in place. Uh, Sixty-nine percent declare that it's part of the procurement process. That one is a very interesting element. Saying it's uh, important, uh, it has the support from the leadership management, it's a strategic priority, but if it's not embedded in your procurement process, it means that when you select your partners, you don't uh, uh, select them based on uh, some sustainability criteria. It means that you may have you know, partners that are completely misaligned with you on, on why or if and why sustain, sustainability matters. But in this industry, which is really uh, a supply chain, a chain, we need to make sure that all the business partners, they have you know, some alignment because can we really say that we are serious uh, with sustainability if our partners are not? So, the, the fact that um, sustainability elements are or not included in the procurement process is actually a very good indicator uh, of the, the maturity level of sustainability agenda within an organization. 61% said that uh, they have a dedicated team in place or at least one person. So it, it can be a team of one or it can be a, a bigger uh, team, but dedicated. Uh, to sustainability. And 43% uh, said that they have a dedicated budget. We ask in the survey more uh, details about the budget, figures, and then comparison com uh, um, uh, compared to the, the year before, etc. But it was actually very difficult to combine and to um, to extrapolate on the, the results. And one of the main reasons is the fact that the sustainability definition differs from one company to another. So if you, uh, if you say that you have a dedicated budget and this is X uh, amount, uh, but it includes all your HR budget, for instance, it's very different from a company that would say HR budget is separate. So it was difficult, so that's why we didn't uh, use the, the results uh, that, that we, uh, we saw in, in the figures uh, themselves. We also ask um, whether or not they, uh, for each of the, the, the priority, uh, the, the focus areas they have, if they, uh, they had set targets, if they had set targets, do they measure uh, the progress against those targets? And do they report and share publicly the, the results of, uh, of their actions uh, through sustainability reports? So we can see that uh, it's 62% uh, that have set some targets. Uh, 64 that said that they are measuring on those targets and 47 that said that uh, they are reporting uh, on sustainability overall. The, um, I, I traditionally, I mean, in my, in my uh, past uh, jobs, uh, I used to have a, a boss who, uh, who used to say that uh, what is not 
measure doesn't exist uh, or cannot be controlled. And what is not communicated also doesn't exist. So I'm very uh, uh, driven by targets and measurement, et cetera, because it's also one way to uh, show concretely uh, the, the progress and, and demonstrate uh, how serious you are. Um, but we, are, we see also in the, um, in the area of sustainability uh, that there is quite a lot of like um, lack of trust. So is it a, a PR exercise for some companies or are they really serious about it? So it's, it can be also important to not only have targets and measurement and reporting, but also maybe to have some sort of validation of the, the real results um, and, and, and real progress that is being made. So a mechanism to build trust and to make sure that you know what is putting uh, out there is for real. So I'd like to conclude uh, with uh, some elements because we ask also in the survey what uh, uh, what role Tiaka can can play and how Tiaka can support the industry and also individual companies. Uh, in the acceleration of uh, the sustainable transformation of, uh, of the industry. And, and I separated in two uh, categories, really the, the role of TIACA uh, at industry level uh, to launch or support industry initiatives, um, develop a uh, global industry commitment with a roadmap towards long-term and short-term goals. So again, setting up targets, measuring, uh, reporting on the uh, on the progress of those targets, but really at industry level. And it's something that airlines uh, and aviation community have done, but it doesn't uh, cover the full spectrum of the air cargo industry. So something that really TIACA can, can do here. Promoting the value of air cargo and its contribution to uh, SDGs, so the Sustainable Development Goals set by the, the United Nations. Uh, it's a series of 17 uh, goals uh, to make the world better and more sustainable uh, by 2030. Um, and, and we already know, and we saw that also during the pandemic and today with the, the vaccines, uh, air cargo is a key contributor to make uh, the world uh, more sustainable. So it's also important uh, to, to promote the role of air cargo in, in making the world better. Uh, and, and there is clearly a role that uh, Tiaka can play here. And then raise awareness on the importance of sustainable transformation of air cargo. So this is for the industry. Uh, to make sure that you know the the sustainability agenda is uh, is understood, uh, uh, be um, taken into account seriously, and and really put uh, higher on on everybody's uh, priority list. And then the second you know uh, type of uh, actions that uh, Tiaka can do is to support companies, so individual uh, companies, members or not. Uh, by identifying business partners to work with, uh, and it's you know what we said. It's it's important to have uh, the the various business partners that are aligned on uh, with the same values uh, as us. Uh, so maybe an independent validation program to make sure that uh, the partners that uh, you work with, individual companies. Uh, are uh, aligned on the same values and same you know, action plan. Uh, networking events also to, uh, to meet uh, future industry partners that share the same vision. Um, help promoting uh, your own initiatives as uh, companies, uh, innovative ideas, best practices, and it's what has been already done uh, and started with the uh, sustainability awards. Um, and I guess um, Stephen will talk about that uh, later, but there is the third edition of the sustainability awards that has been launched. 
Um, and then identifying sustainability initiatives to join. So we, we show uh, on the slides uh, all those initiatives like uh, Smart Trade Center, uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, SAFA, uh, Corsia. I mean, many things are existing on environment, but not only. Uh, and and Tiaka can can be a knowledge platform to just explain you know what uh, each uh, each of them is all about, uh, what the the audience is, what you can uh, achieve with that, etc. And then also um, glue uh, glue up the 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 industry and unite the industry uh, with uh, with some partnership that that would be helpful. So that's the role that uh, that Tiaka can play, and it it's it was uh, you know the outcomes of that survey within the comments in the different uh, questions that we uh, we raised. So do not duplicate the existing efforts, but come complement and unite the industry uh, with what is uh, what is missing. And that's the end of my presentation. So. If you have any question, please uh, feel free uh, to ask. I think uh, we have the chat box uh, that is open. So I don't know, Glenn, if yep. we have any question. Uh, a couple of quick questions. Uh, but first of all, thank you very much for running through that, uh, that report, uh, Celine. Uh, some tremendous uh, information in there. And as, uh, as you mentioned, and as I mentioned at the beginning, it kind of forms now the ground zero. Um, now, that leads me to my first question. You obviously, and we all agree, we would like to expand the number of organizations participating in the survey. So if any of our people who are viewing this either live or on the rebroadcasts as we'll do when we have this posted on the YouTube channel, um, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming it's open to all companies. So would we just invite them to drop an email to us at Tiaka? The email address will come up at the end of the presentation, the end of the slides, um, and just saying that they'd be interested so we can put them on uh, the recipient database for the next survey round. Because Perfect. Absolutely. So that's really open to all. The first, the first survey we ask. Uh, so it was sent and published externally, promoted uh, on social media, on Tiaka's website, to uh, with within Tiaka's members. But we also reach out to uh, partner organizations, uh, to ACI, ICAO. FIATA, IATA, et cetera, and, and many of them, they uh, responded positively and send, send that to their own members and own uh, community. So the more you know, we, uh, we can have answers, the better. Great. Now, a couple of questions from our, from our audience. The first one is some of the earlier slides, you, you have different bar charts, of, sorry, different um, aspects where you talk about awareness stage, measurement, reporting, improvements. Is that really the progress stages that an organization goes through? So is it really the way that an organization transitions? So if somebody's just at the awareness stage, does it mean they've really just started this and that they hope to progress through? Is this one of the things that we hope to achieve in subsequent surveys is to not achieve, but see, how the organizations have moved up through the scale? So that's a good question. And we realized when we analyzed the, the survey result with Justina that we didn't, you know, uh, specify or define uh, very clearly in the survey what we meant by a wellness uh, measurement reporting stage. Uh, so something that we will fix for, for the next uh, surveys for sure. Um, traditionally, uh, when, when you start with an initiative, you start by raising awareness. So just, you know, talking about it, just uh, getting some uh, uh, knowledge about it, reading, uh, going to webinars, etc. So that's, that's usually the first step. Um, and, and then the, the measurement and reporting, it can be, you can report what you are not doing <laughs> or you can report uh, what, you know, the, the final result is. And that's where uh, this, this is maybe uh, just uh, lacking some uh, clarification on, on how we define and the, the steps. But obviously for, for 
the, the monitoring of the progress uh, next time we run the survey, it will be interesting to see how many uh, uh, went from you know, no focus to some sort of focus, whether it's mm. within the uh, awareness, improvement, reporting, measurement stage. Excellent. And now just another couple of quick ones. There is a question about fuel, but I think we'll cover that under the, um, the, the planet aspect a little bit later on. So uh, Diraj, we won't, we won't forget that. We'll come back to that. And, uh, and I think there's more of an observation, but perhaps you can just kind of comment on this from Christine, which is when you talk about some of the, the charts, which talk about commitment, um, some of the areas, obviously, a company can have a significant influence over, for example, um, training, education, carbon emissions, its procurement process. These are things that are directly in its control. Others, it has a little bit of a less involvement, such as, for example, Ill illegal wildlife trafficking. Yep. Um, and perhaps that's why that, that percentage that there, which was 11, was a little bit lower because it's seen as a bigger global issue. And perhaps yeah. organizations don't see their particular part in that. Um, but would you agree that it's, it's even though it may be a, a larger global issue, organizations can still play a part, no matter how global the issue is in their little bit. But as I say, it's more of an observation, perhaps just a quick comment, and then for time, I'll, I'll move on to the next session. Yeah, the, that's, that's the, the complexity of this kind of survey when we want to be uh, covering the entire supply chain. But frankly, uh, the focus of a shipper compared to a packaging uh, company compared to an airline is by nature different. Uh, so the more uh, answers we will get, uh, the more granularity also in the uh, analysis we, uh, we will be able to, uh, to have. Uh, illegal wildlife trafficking is high on the agenda for uh, airlines, for instance, with the Buckingham Palace um, uh, declaration. Uh, it's probably uh, not re a real focus for packaging companies. And, and that's quite obvious. Uh, while for uh, uh, packaging companies, uh, the waste management is going to be uh, a thing. It's, it's a big thing. So it's, it's normal. Excellent. Great. Well, Celine, thank you very much for running through that. I know there was a lot of material there. So a lot of people yeah. will say, could, you know, how do they get a copy of the report? So I'm just telling everybody that we will release the report actually later today. Yep. And this presentation will actually be live on the YouTube channel probably in the next couple of days. Uh, perhaps yeah, even and, well. and slides will be made also available. And the, the report itself is, uh, I mean, I, would, I couldn't cover absolutely everything from the report uh, today. So you have more details on the report uh, and it's, it's going to be released, uh, as you said, uh, today. Excellent. Thank you, Celine. So if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you very much. Um, so as we said, we actually wanted to, to now do a little bit of a spotlight session where we're going to be looking at uh, the people, the planet and the prosperity areas from a particular perspective of an individual. Um, and with, with that, uh, next slide please, I'd like to introduce Liana Coyne. Um, Liana is the Chief Operating Officer of Coyne Airways, which is a pioneering non-asset based cargo airline. They specialize in scheduled and charter lift and niche destinations you know, and I'll just list a few, Armenia, Georgia, Iraq, Afghanistan, Caucasus, Central Asia, and Africa. And obviously the, the current COVID uh, vaccine situation will obviously impact uh, demand to those areas quite, uh, quite heavily. Uh, Liana has recently joined the board of advisors for Cargo AI, which is a new digital platform. And I'm also very pleased to announce that Liana also is our newest board member of Tiaka. So we're very pleased to have Liana join us there. Liana is an uh, Oxford University graduate uh, and actually is a solicitor by, by trade art. So we can have somebody monitoring all of our compliance aspects during the conference. Um, and now, of course, she is part of the family business. It's a name that's known to all of our listeners around the world, um, and particularly as uh, uh, Larry was our most recent Hall of Fame inductee last year. Uh, Liana is based in Dubai and she's very passionate about the people aspects. So we're very pleased and thank you, Liana, for taking the time to, to share your views with, with our audience with regards to that particular component of sustainability. So with that, Liana, over to you. Thank you, Glenn, and thank you for the introduction um, and the background about my company, Coin Airways. I'm actually not here in my Coin Airways capacity, but really as an advocate for change and for prioritizing people. 
So as we heard in Celine's presentation, 14% of respondents said diversity and inclusion were not a focus, and only 53% have training and education programs. I can understand that the past year has faced strain on everyone, and that many companies may feel that they're struggling to keep their heads above water. But I put it to you that people, and in particular, inclusivity and education, and an investment in people are more important than ever. To touch first on what diversity and inclusivity is, there's a great quote by Werner Meyer, who's the head of diversion and inclus and diversity and inclusion for Netflix, who says that diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. So diversity is basically the makeup of your team and how it reflects your community in terms of things like gender, race, age, sexual orientation, and disability. However, it's no good putting together a diverse team unless you listen to them and harness their strengths. An inclusive work environment is one in which all individuals are treated fairly and respectfully, have equal access to opportunities and resources, and can contribute fully to the organization's success. Aside from considerations of equity and social justice, there's a serious dividend to diversity and inclusion. A study by, by McKinsey, the international consulting firm, showed empirical evidence that one, greater diversity in the workforce results in greater profitability and value creation. And two, there is a statistically significant correlation between diverse leadership and better financial performance. If you think about it, this shouldn't be surprising. Every business is a people business. So don't let the airplanes, pallets and cargo fool you. As an industry, as individual companies and as leaders, we need to invest in people. And when it has such an impact on the bottom line, can you really afford not to? So if you go to the next slide, please. So to explore this further and to share with you the results of some further research, studies have shown that teams that are gender, age, and ethnically diverse make better decisions up to 87% of the time. Diverse companies enjoy 2.3 times higher cash flow per employee. I know that's per employee, not per company, which is a huge, huge amount. Organizations with inclusive leaders are 70% more likely to have captured a new market in the past 12 months. Inclusive companies are 1.7 times more likely to be innovation leaders in their markets. And employees that have worked with an inclusive leader demonstrate 81% greater engagement and loyalty. Next slide, please. So really, can you afford not to focus on people? I would say no. I'd also urge you not to be intimidated by the need for big systemic changes, whether on a societal, industry, or company basis. You can be the change you want to see. You can make a difference by making sure you engage and connect with your colleagues in a respectful way that which values their individuality. You can lead by example. You can sponsor, coach, or mentor someone who might need help. I would wager that many of you in the audience can recall someone in your career who helped you and made a particular impact on you. You can be that person to someone, whether through a formal or informal scheme. You can make sure that there is time for training, whether on the job, in the classroom or online. I'm a particular fan of online training which, that can be rolled out cost effectively or even free and be self-paced. Indeed, I hope that more training providers offer online training as an option going forward. Living in Dubai, it seems absurd to me that the courts of law here can get satisfaction that I am who I say that I am in a formal hearing, but somehow a training provider would provide my, would insist on my physical presence in a classroom. Further, you can do what you can to ensure that there is fair access to opportunities at the hiring stage, throughout employment and for promotion. Finally, you can learn from other companies and apply the most appropriate and effective best practices, not just from our industry. And as we heard from Celine, the idea is that for Tiaka to help identify some of those best practices. So watch this space. Next slide, please. So in the meantime, I've listed a few articles here with various ideas and inspiration of ways that you can make your workplace more inclusive. I'd also urge everyone to sign up to the Women in Aviation and Logistics Pledge, which I'm sure Celine would be happy to tell you more about. And for that pledge, you can do that as a company or as an individual. So really, if there's one message I can leave you with it with today, it's do something. It doesn't have to be everything yesterday. It can just be a start. You can make an impact as an individual. You can make an impact as a company. And we can make an impact as an industry. So thank you for your time. 
Leanna, thank you very much for that. And I, and I really like the way that you introduce yourself as an advocate for change and uh, your passion for this area really comes through. Um, and some of those statistics, it, it just makes good business sense. You know, it's not just the right thing to do for from the moral perspective, but even from a business perspective. Um, but I have a, a couple of quick questions. Um, first of all, when you describe what is the probably the most diverse and therefore the most successful type of environment, sadly, I'm reminded of when I attend industry events and I see a lot of people like me in the audience. You know, we're all wearing the same color suits. Most of us have had degrees of hair loss. Most of us have, you know, we're, we're in a similar age, et cetera. Do you see that the industry is starting to change now? Okay, you're relatively young compared to this, but you've obviously grown up in this industry through, through COIN um, and through aviation. So you've been involved in it for a long time, but are you seeing some positive moves forward? So in other words, do you feel that the message is starting to get through that a, mo that a more diverse and inclusive workforce is good for air cargo? Yes, definitely. And, and I'm beginning to see the audiences change. And I think, for example, the database that um, Celine Change Horizon and I mean, some communications are putting together of, of women speakers will mean that there'll be more diverse panels going forward. I mean, I hope so. Um, and I think that, you know, in a way, the industry has to change. It has no choice. We need to have young people moving through. Um, there is a kind of no a normal rate of attrition with people retiring. Um, and I think it's kind of down to all of us to take some responsibility for opening the way for young people to come through, for um, people who are different to us to come through, just to have that choice. I mean, the thing is, you don't have to be in the industry. It, I mean, it's not something which is so, I mean, okay, apart from some very specific jobs, there are a lot of things that we can learn from people in other industries there's a lot of scope for transferable skills. So I think we need to shake, shake things up and take responsibility for opening the gateways a bit. Excellent. And, and to be honest, I'm just, again, really pleased that you've joined the board because this is that kind of passionate thoughts that will help drive us as Tiaka to support the industry in this. We've, we have made the pledge and we've joined and we're happy to support the, the initiative that the industry is undertaking that. Just so my final question to you is if, again, some of the audience today, if they ha perhaps haven't joined that Women in Aviation and Logistics pledge, it is available on the website. Would you recommend that everybody should look at it? Because I think your key message there was we should all do something. You know, as long as we're all doing some little bits, they all add up to a lot. Exactly. We're not going to solve the problem of discrimination or unconscious bias or all the various microaggressions by ourselves. There are huge systemic changes that need to happen, you know, with regard to the, the structure of the workplace with regard to things like the motherhood penalty, et cetera. But we can all do something. And if we all do just one small thing, it will make a difference. Excellent. I think that's a, a great last, last word message. So thank you again, Liana, and uh, very much appreciate your, your time and support for this important activity. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? Oh, who's that guy? Um, I won't read his bio, it's far, he's been in the industry you, far too you long. Do want me to introduce you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's just, uh, you know, it's just what we just said before. I mean, we say that this guy's been in the industry 37, 38 years, um, blah, 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 blah. So with that, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, I'm actually going to just spend a few minutes talking about, and this is a slide that Celine used earlier. I'm going to use two of her slides again, because I think, you know, they're, they're quite important for this particular aspect about the impact on the planet. And as Celine has said, that as an industry and as Tiaka, we're committed to, to doing what we can to support uh, in terms of the reduction on, in terms of an environmental footprint. And I just wanted to talk um, there, you know, 56% talk about uh, carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. Now, there are different sectors of the industry that obviously have different aspects of the influence that they can place on this. And we know that the aviation sector, for example, in terms of transport modes, was the very first, in fact, the first by many years to actually come out with some industry targets. Uh, and it set that initial industry target as, as carbon neutral growth from 2020 onwards, with an overall target of a 50% net CO2 reduction by 2050 versus 2005. Um, but it has to be said, many others in the sector have actually set even more ambitious targets. And we're starting to see quite a, a large proliferation of 
organizations focusing on, on net zero. But one question that has to then come about, which is either a 50% reduction or net zero, how does this get achieved? And of course, it, it's not just achieved by, again, the same thinking and the same actions that's got us to where we are today. So there is a very uh, strong number of different initiatives over several pillars. Uh, much of that is about technology. We already have a question about propulsion systems. Of course, that will be a, a leading part. Um, and it's interesting to see that the major manufacturers are also looking at electrification of, of certainly smaller, perhaps regional sized jets. They feel that the development in uh, uh, battery technology um, could even be a viable source, certainly during that, that time frame that we're talking about. But technology is not going to do it alone. It's also looking at uh, sustainable aviation fuels, SAFs or SARTs. You know, that is an aspect, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in detail. But it's also about economic measures, whether or not it's, it's offsets, for example, to actually um, put investments into schemes which then take carbon out of the atmosphere. And, and it's interesting because sustainable aviation fuels is actually about taking materials which otherwise would be waste or plant material, et cetera, um, and even recycling old clothes, vegetable oil, cooking oil, et cetera, and going through a process where it's recycled into an alternative fuel for aviation. And what's that it's doing over its life cycle? It's actually called you know, CO2 life cycle um, emissions because it's actually then releasing what is it already has stored. So it has actually captured CO2 and in the process of burning it on an aircraft, it's actually creating that zero environment because it's releasing what it's already captured. Um, and there's been a lot of very high profile initiatives. Uh, one of the key ones came out last year between Lufthansa Cargo and DB Schenker uh, to actually have a CO2 neutral flight going through from, from Europe to China. It's part of a regular rotation. I think it's weekly. Um, and, and this is an example of a number of initiatives of how the industry is actually committed to using sustainable fuels. Now, one of the key things about the word sustainable is quite often people will challenge and say, well, if you're gonna use plant-based, are you not taking land that would be dedicated for agriculture and turning that into a fuel source because it perhaps might yield a, a higher value? Well, the answer is no, because that's not sustainable. So it's actually not about redesignating food um, production into sustainable fuels. It's about looking at others, whether or not it's, it's grass cuttings, plant material, et cetera. You know, it's a lot of other initiatives or a lot of other um, resources or, or raw material that can be used for uh, sustainable aviation fuel. I believe, and I, I took some numbers down earlier, that there's been more than 300,000 flights since 2016, which have actually had a component of uh, sustainable fuel within them. The fuel itself is very, very close to jet kerosene, so it can actually easily be mixed and blended, doesn't require any additional filtration system or any other change to propulsion systems, so it's actually easily implemented. Um, I saw that there's about 100 million litres have actually been ordered or will actually be produced this year, but that in itself is just a tiny percent, perhaps one, uh, maybe around 1% of the total um, jet kerosene requirements. Um, there is actually a number of growing airlines. In fact, I believe it's over 45 airlines were actually, which have actually so far uh, implemented uh, sustainable aviation fuel within its uh, uh, fuel mix. And of course, one of the challenges going forward, and this is where the industry really needs to have a united voice, is that we need much more support research development from governments around the world, because of course, Fuel itself needs to be available everywhere, and we would need to and encourage governments to actually work with industry and work with the fuel suppliers to come up with a significantly increased availability, as it is a significant component of the challenges going forward. So there is quite a lot of work, quite a lot of innovation that's going on in, in that particular area, and the industry is very committed to achieving these targets. Um, well, I'll talk about just one of the other aspects here, which is waste. Um, we know the industry has, has often looked at how it uses uh, single-use plastics, um, and uh, there has been in recent years innovation, so you actually have some biodegradable or enhanced biodegradable plastics using a, a polymer-based, uh, biodegradable polymer-based um, molecular structure, um, which obviously is something that is very good for the industry. 
The amount of e-commerce has actually had an increase in the packaging. We've all received those e-commerce packages, which we open up a big box to find a smaller box. Uh, and I think that the industry is working with the uh, platforms and, and others to raise the awareness and the need to make sure that we have, as it were, optimal packaging. Um, it needs to achieve what it needs to achieve, but without creating undue and unnecessary wastage. And we also need to enhance the recycling for those materials so they can actually then be put back into the cycle, as it were. And one other area of, uh, of wastage, which is something which I think the industry is also starting to look at, which is facilities. Cargo facilities traditionally have been built based on peak demand and peak requirements rather than optimized. So it's actually really important going forward that we can have efficient facilities so that the cargo can be processed as efficiently and as fast as is practicable through them so that they can actually be of an optimal size. And optimal size facilities will obviously have a reduced energy need, and of course can actually then have a much less of an impact. Uh, we're already pleased to see that a lot of, of water is being recycled um, through as it were roof uh, traps and, and gray water and recycling programs and some of the newer facilities. So there's a lot of work that can be performed there. As Tiaka, we're playing our part. Uh, we've introduced something new, which is members in the news. And this is a way of us actually trying to share and share this or shine the spotlight and sharing those best practices, uh, examples that uh, our members are actually um, engaged in. So next slide, please. Celine mentioned during her presentation, um, these number of very, very good initiatives, great initiatives, um, very diverse in terms of what they seek to tackle. But of course, an industry that is predominantly operating on a day-to-day -day critical basis of getting cargo moved through the system, particularly some of the more sensitive cargo, as an industry, we don't always have the time to be able to sit back and look at these various initiatives and say, well, which ones should I support? Which one should I be a member of? How can they benefit me? How can I benefit them? So we've made a commitment as Tiaka that we will actually um, go through and we will build up a repository, as it were, a, a a simplification guide so that we can kind of, again, um, broaden the knowledge base that members of the industry have of these various initiatives, but try and also do it in a way that they can understand a little bit more in a more simplifi uh, simplified fashion of how they can actually benefit in terms of achieving the overall sustainability goals. Um, and I think that this is something that's going to become more critical going forward as the sustainability agenda becomes higher on everybody's uh, radar, as it were. So with that, that was just a quick couple of um, comments on some of the important areas that's going on under the, under the planet aspect. The industry has some good initiatives. As Tiaka, we want to do our best to promote those and share the best practices. But of course, the last part of the three, and with the next slide, is prosperity. And as I mentioned at the beginning, prosperity is something which is critical, an industry that is, is profitable and an industry that actually can continually improve and become more efficient is then an industry that can help improve the overall um, planet in which it's actually operating in. So we're very pleased today have uh, Stefan Noll. Stefan, despite his youthful looks here, has actually been in the industry for, for over 30 years. And he's also one of those unique individuals that has actually had a, a very broad set of experiences. He's, he's worked for some airlines, uh, he worked for KLM, he worked for Swiss, particularly in the, in the mail side and the logistics side. He's worked for Trade Association. He was uh, running the E-Freight and in fact was, was running the European uh, cargo activity for IATA, so a former great colleague. Uh, he's also worked in the forwarding sector for Bax Global in Paris. Um, and now he's working for one of the leading industry technology partners, Champ Cargo Systems. Uh, Champ is also our sustainability partner, and uh, we work collaboratively on the uh, sustainability awards. Stefan is an expert uh, on UN CFACT international trade procedures. And today he's going to talk to us about um, how the digitalization activity can actually help organizations go through this sustainability transformation. So with that, Stefan, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Glyn, and it's a real pleasure for us to, uh, to, to support uh, this program, which is very important for our industry. I think sustainability and digitization are hand in hand. Uh, actually, if we look at 
sustainability as a business opportunity also to help challenging the status quo. Today we have, uh, we know air cargo is a very complex animal with a lot of processes heavily regulated where uh, automatization, digitization did not really deliver as much as we would have loved to, uh, to, to, to make an impact. And I think that with a sustainability perspective, you can really look at improving your performance and using digitization as a mean of, uh, of performance. And uh, that's something that many companies have been doing. We have had, uh, as uh, presented by Glyn, I was uh, leading the IFRED program and the EOB program in, in Europe for, for a couple of years. And sometimes digitization does not really help you if you maintain the same processes. If we look at the EOB process, uh, the adoption was very low because in fact, we wanted to keep the same processes, the same paper processes. And I think if we would have looked at it from a digitization perspective and uh, from a, a sustainability perspective, we would have realized that by introducing air rebuild, we have increased the number of printing. Huh? We have printed air rebuilds at the beginning, at the end, during transit, everywhere. So it was not really, if we would have had this perspective on sustainable, how do we do it? How do we merge it with uh, digitalization? We might have done a better job uh, in, in doing that. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So have a look at sustainability as a business opportunity. What does it bring for you? Uh, I will take a simple exa example of what, uh, what uh, we are exploring uh, also uh, within Champ and other companies are doing the same. Uh, we are making a difference between digitizing and digitalizing. Uh, when you digitize a paper process, as I mentioned before, you tend to keep the same steps. But if really you consider from a sustainable apport, ha approach, how can I ease the, the work, I can limit the task. Here we have an example of uh, doing a weight and balance. Uh, it's just basically how you can optimize the load of your aircraft. And today we have many systems that are built around an analog approach, meaning that you are you move from a calculator to an Excel sheet and you put the Excel sheet in a, in a, in a mobile application. Uh, yes, you save a little bit of time, but fundamentally from, from a sustainable aspect, you still lose, lose a lot of time and actually you don't optimize the, the, the trim of the plane. Uh, using an algorithm, for example, if you use an algorithm and you check this, you balance this algorithm against the aircraft specification and how you can optimize the, the trim, then it will have an impact not only on the consumption of your flight, but also on your process, you can do this uh, uh, weight and balance operation in seconds. And by doing it in seconds, uh, you are using an algorithm that guarantees the safety of the aircraft, but also the optimum load. So these are examples uh, just we are uh, exchanging uh, for the industry where we, we believe that with this sustainability perspective, you really can make a really good impact. And this has a profit uh, it's profitable for, for your company. Let's not forget that over 65% of the respondents to the survey said it's important for customers, employees, and business partners. So it's basically your whole ecosystem that uh, you can have uh, also uh, uh, connected together. And having sustainability and digitalization as part of your focus, I think it's, it's a good way to, uh, to measure uh, a big progress. Thank you very much, Glyn. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, thank you, Stefan. That's that's excellent. And and to be honest, when you see, you know, the number difference that you've got on this slide, you know, some processes that could take sixty to ninety minutes can be actually done in seconds if you actually say, "I don't need to do this process. I need to have the same outcome, but how can I do it more efficiently and more effectively?" It it just makes good business sense. So so my question to you, Stefan. Um, is it too late if a company hasn't started down that path of digitalization? And it came up, as you said, in Celine's presentation as well about how it's a critical enabler of a number of sustainability initiatives. So does an organization need to feel, oh, I've missed the boat or is it never too late to start down that path? I, I think the answer is very clear. It's never too late and it will be never too late. It's just a matter of uh, how it makes an impact on your business. How is your relationship with your customers, how does uh, this digitization, how, how this program fit? It's also a question of culture. Uh, how, how does it help my company? How is it, 
you, we are, uh, as you said, we, we have a bunch of, uh, of people that we live with and retire soon in our industry. Do we want to, uh, to, to, to keep our legacy systems uh, as, as we have today? So it's never too late, uh, that's for sure. And I believe that uh, the younger generation coming on board, they have grown up with, uh, with uh, different perspective. And I think they will make a difference, but I don't think it's, it's too late. It's never too late when you want to improve. That's definitely for sure. Excellent. And I think, you know, Stefan, you've just raised a very important aspect there, which is kind of linking what Liana was saying and about this whole matter is the next generation of workforce will not be comfortable going to a company that is all about paper, pens and calculators, because that's not their world. Their world is TikTok, Facebook, Instagram. I said this and my daughter said to me, Dad, Facebook is so yesterday. It's not Facebook anymore. Um, but technology moves on. And you're right. We need to have that right technological environment to attract that next generation. And of course, it will help improve their particular work environment and the impact on society. So, Stefan, thank you very much for your, your thoughts today. And thank you for your ongoing support. And appreciate your very clear guidance here for everybody about digitalization has been key. So thank you. So if we move on now to the, the wrapping up, um, and as we said, in, in Tiaka, we actually have a, a commitment to not just talk about the initiatives, but also have a, a plan and a path to actually create some concrete actions. So with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, a very young gentleman, the chairman of Tiaka, um, Mr. Stephen Pullmans. Um, from, uh, from a perspective of, of chair and driving a number of these initiatives, and congratulations to him as, as one of the leading um, uh, spokespersons behind the need to have the sustainability agenda for Tiaka. With that, can I hand over to Stephen for conclusions and a, and a bit of a wrap up? Over to you, Stephen. Thank you, Glyn. Uh, let, let me start by apologizing for everybody who is still uh, on, on, on board. Uh, we are uh, going a bit over time, so I'll try to keep it short, but uh, an awful uh, lot of interesting things have been said. Eh? So where to start? And I'm going to start with, uh, with one of the things Leanne said and I really, really liked a lot is the, the, the comment on diversity, being invited to the party and inclusiveness, uh, being invited to dance, being a very bad dancer. I feel a bit uh, uncomfortable now if I should still go to the party and what I should do. So that's something personally for me to take in mind. But, but like Glenn said, I'm, I'm very happy and proud that we as Tiaka have put sustainability very high on the agenda. Uh, two years ago already in, in Budapest. And for me, it was very important um, after some discussions with Celine um, that, we, that we needed to create this awareness that sustainability is so much more than just environmental. Eh? And a lot of is, is done on, on that level on environmental and the survey learned us that, that companies are not looking for another program on just environmental. But it's also about indeed creating that equal opportunity uh, embracing technology, training. It's really about shaping our future world that we want to live in. And not only we, but also the generations that will follow us. And I think that that is for me so important. Eh? Today we call sustainability, it's part of a project, it's initiative. But honestly, uh, it, it should be part of our everyday life. It should be part of our DNA. It should be part of our thinking and everything we do. So it should evolve from that project to something that is going to like our basic nature. And I think that is the ambition. And that is how we as Tiaka are going to act ourselves on everything we do and how we look at the, uh, at the industry. It's really good to see from the survey that sustainability is important for a lot of companies. And that despite the COVID situation, it's also growing importance. It shows that in times of crisis, people are not just dropping sustainability. And I think that's already a strong point. And once again, confirming how important sustainability is. The more sustainable a company is, the better you can survive any crisis. And that is the message that we need to deliver. The more inclusive, the more sustainable you are, the better business decisions you will take. We call everybody to walk the talk. We will do that ourselves. We will take part of everything. We will support where possible. We will create awareness and we will launch different initiatives. I do want to thank Celine for what she did on, on sustainability for TIAC in the past two years for the great work on this study, together with the team, uh, Glyn and, and, and Rachel and Kenneth. Um, it's the first step. Eh? A lot has to come. We will walk the talk. 
Um, this is a first uh, yearly report. Uh, it's a first step, a zero base measurement, like, like Glenn said. It has a lot of info that we will use to start taking initiatives, but it will also be great to see what is going to happen in the years to come and to measure that evolution and progress, yeah? because that, I think, will also inspire, uh, inspire people. Personally, I do have a few dreams when it comes to sustainability. Yeah? I really believe that, uh, and, and I hope that I can still uh, push this forward together with the ACA, that we can come up with a kind of a sustainability logistics index that really creates that visibility uh, and support uh, on, on, on sustainability for every company. So I hope that is some, some or one of these initiatives that, uh, that we can work on. One important topic I want to take home today, and that's a strong message, knowing that we are all working or a lot of us are working from home, being at home, but still I'll take it downstairs later on, is that there is no clear definition for sustainability. There are big regional differences. Huh? that a lot of work still needs to be done. Um, but the good thing is also we don't need a standard. Eh? We don't need an agreement to get started. And also, uh, Leanne said that uh, before, there is no excuse not to make that first step yet. Everybody can start working on sustainability. It's not that you need a common standard on technology before you can do something, not at all. And there are a lot of things that, that we are going to try to inspire people about. And, and by saying that first step, I'll come back to my dancing. Maybe my first step will be following some dancing lessons that on every initiative we take, I can be inclusive and invite everybody to dance without stepping on everybody's toes. So thank you very much to everybody for this great document and for their support, also for the strategic partners uh, on, on this project. They are crucial in, in making this happen. And for us, this is the not the first step because we are working already on it for two years, but I really think we, we are kicking off our sustainability program as an association uh, and it will be very prominent in the years uh, to come. There are a few more slides Celine, that I will try to do very quickly, not all of them. Uh, uh, we are going to have our executive summit. As part of our sustainability, it's all going to be on innovation. Uh, which I think is really important. Uh, I invite everybody to have a look at it. We are going to make it 100% refundable due to COVID, but at the same time, we are very optimistic that, uh, that we will be able to organize it. And it's great to see so much interest already from the industry. It shows that uh, the, the more digital we become, the need for that human touch is also going to be crucial and important and also part of sustainability, of course. So have a look if you're interested, do not hesitate to reach out to us. Then of course, we also have again, our Hall of Fame. Um, I think showing uh, respect uh, and gratitude to some great people in this industry is also part of what we need to do. Um, so we are calling to everybody, if you have great candidates, uh, there is a deadline nomination of July 15, so plenty of time, but uh, if you have anybody in mind, please bring them forward uh, and we look forward to include them in the nominee list. And then finally, um, the sustainability award. Eh? It has been already said a few times. Uh, we've had two sustainability awards so far. We are now going to our third award. We want to support any initiative on, on sustainability and reward it. Eh? Supporting that social welfare, people development, social programs, equal opportunities, that economical development, business efficiency, trade development, also the environmental impact. It is part of sustainability. And we believe that innovation and partnership are indeed cru uh, crucial elements in, in, in sustainability. That's also why these are the parameters uh, that we are going to use in, in selecting the finalists. Sustainability, and again, that's the key message for me, covers every aspect of our lives and businesses. That also means that basically every company, every trade association should be able to find something as an entry for this award. So I also call on everybody, please have a look around you and do participate. Not only are we going to reward winners, but we also recognize as many initiatives as possible and a lot of these initiatives will again inspire people and companies in our industry because they will see concrete examples of initiatives being taken and being successful. So there is no excuse for not participating. 
already participating in the sustainability awards for me is a big step forward in doing something towards getting a better sustainable environment for our industry. So please have a look and participate and, and hopefully uh, we can welcome uh, you on stage as one of the winners uh, in September in San Francisco. Glyn, do you take over from here again or do you want me to conclude even this one? <laughs> I, I think this is just our, our wrap up, Stephen. It's just Perfect. thank you. Here's the contact details. Please use this if people want to participate in the next round of surveys, or if you have any questions about theater activity, please follow us, subscribe to our Twitter account, YouTube. Um, we do run the safe supply training courses, which we have here. And Stephen, you covered everything perfectly. So thank you very much for that. You're welcome, Glenn. Thanks a lot to everybody. Have a nice day and uh, look forward to the next uh, event we do.